All right, we're at 4.30. I'll begin. Again, welcome, my friends. It's good to be with you here in Holy Innocence, in the chapel, in the Christ Church Chapel. Most of you know that I started as a youth minister. It was five and a half wonderful years of my life and some of the most both, well, joyful and challenging ministries that I've done. Part of that ministry was to be in, well, a camp counselor. I would spend most of my summers at one camp or another helping out with different programs and doing all I could to work with children and youth. Now, what I discovered very quickly is in the first year or two, all you can do is hold on for dear life and try and keep up with all the things that are going on. Uh, by year three or four, some patterns start to emerge and you start to learn all sorts of new things. One of those things, and you could set your watch by it, was that right about halfway, say Wednesday of a week-long camp, all the kids started to melt down. It just got to be hard. Some would get angry, some would start to fight, some would be sad. Others would just be completely out of sorts. Even if they were quiet, you could tell things weren't quite right. And every now and then, you'd find someone who was self-aware enough to be able to say that they were homesick, that they were gone long enough and were ready to just go back home, back to the way things were. And the hard thing was, no matter what you could do, no matter what you could console or say, people tended to just get upset and anxious on the middle of the week. My friends, I think we are in many ways in the same spot right now. That is to say, I think we are about halfway through this process of quarantine and we're starting to get a little chippy, and a little angsty and worried. Now here's the thing, we can say unequivocally that scripture tells us that this is a normal way of going about things in the world. Psychologists would tell us it's normal and scripture would back that up. In one moment that we might all know pretty well, Moses goes up on the mountain. He tends, spends 40 days and 40 nights with God, getting the Ten Commandments, all sorts of instructions for how Israel can become a new nation, a new people. Israel, though, the people all gathered at the bottom of the mountain after 40 days and 40 nights get stir crazy. They get anxious. They get worried. And they decide to go back to what they knew. They get homesick for Egypt. And in Egypt, they had all these different gods and images they could worship, and so they made a golden calf. The same is true, actually, in the season we're in now. In the season of Easter, in these great 50 days, the disciples see Jesus crucified, they see him die, they see him resurrected, they meet the risen Lord. And what's their response? What do they do in response to all of this wonderful moment? Well, Peter says very clearly in John 21, 3, I'm going fishing. He goes back to what he knows. He goes back to what was before. It is a natural thing to want everything to go back to the way it was and for everything to be easy and to figure it out. I ask you to join me today for just a few minutes because I wanted to share the state of the parish. On one hand, I can say unequivocally, the parish is healthy and well and strong. Thanks to so many of you, we've been able to keep up with our giving at this point. You've continued to give and keep everything open and going well, and we thank you for those gifts. Our attendance online seems to actually be going up. We seem to be reaching more people both throughout the week for morning prayer and on Sundays. It is a good time in its own way just to be together, and we are doing well. At the same time, I think we're in that, well, halfway through blues or getting a little chippy, a little anxious, worried and grumpy, wondering what is coming next. And that's probably the question I get the most often from all of you is, when can we go back to church? And often, unintentionally, people will say, when can we go back to the way it was before? 
We're homesick for what we knew in January and February because we're just halfway through this mess and we don't know what's coming next. Like I said, this is a natural place to be. It's an okay place to be because no one wants to be halfway through. They want to go on to the next thing or go back to what was before, but being in between is no fun at all. It's why they call it a midlife crisis, after all. We want to be one place or the other, not just stuck in between. What I can share with you unequivocally is this. We will not be able to go back to the way it was before. Let me be clear, we'll be able to come back and one day worship in this space. We'll be able to do in-person worship and share the sacraments, have communion, celebrate together, hug, and embrace one another again. Those days will come. But the bigger thing that we have to name is that whenever someone goes into the wilderness, and we are certainly in the wilderness, my friends, God asks us to do something new on the other side. Today, we got the news from our bishop, from Rob Wright, our bishop of Atlanta, that he's been working with a group of scientists and doctors and members of the CDC, all Episcopalians, to form a task force to talk about when it is safe to come back to church, to worship as a community. They shared the hard news that we will not come back in May, and we're not sure when we will come back in the future. It's simply not safe to have groups more than 10 or 12 gathered together at this time. And I willingly defer both to our bishop and to those experts because I want to keep all of you safe. But what I wanted to share with you more is the invitation I believe God is making to us. If we're really to listen to scripture, if we're really to listen to the witness of what has come before of times when people are in the wilderness, we know that when people come out, They are a new people. The world is not always changed, but they are. And so I think the great invitation to all of us in this process, the invitation to Holy Innocence is how can we become a new community? How can we think of new ways to be the church that are not just Sunday morning at 10 o'clock? How can we think of ways, dream of ways to be God's expression of love in the world? Here's the real scary part then, my friends. This is not just my job. And it's not just the job of Kenya or Buddy or the clergy or the staff. It's all of our job together to dream of new ways to be God's people in the world, to imagine a new world where we start to question why things are set up the way they are and even more to do something about. I think in the days ahead, we'll be focusing more and more on small group ministry. We'll be talking more and more about how can we worship together even while being distant. But somewhere even deeper than all of that, we're going to be seeking to, where is God calling us right now? It will take all of us together in prayer and reflection and thought and imagination to think of new ways of being a community. Pray for new ways of being God's people. So if you have ideas, hopes, dreams for how we can do some things new, share them with me, share them with our staff, share them with anyone. I want to hear those new ways of being church because I truly believe that whenever we can come back to in-person worship, we will also continue online worship. Whenever we can come back together and have our meetings and our committees and our programs, we'll also be saying, how can we reach out to those who only can see us online? How can we be a church being called into a new place, into a new way of being? Or said more simply, how can we be an Easter people, my friend? A people of new life and of hope above all of imagination. We are doing well, Holy Innocence. We are in that mid-quarantine crisis, maybe. But we are strong. We are happy and well in our own rights. And I just pray that you join me in thinking of new ways that God can call us to be church. New ways of thinking of how God can call us to love and care for one another. Amen. Thank you for watching, my friends, and stay well.